Jean Daniel has been a strong supporter of visual analytics in Canada, and we've seen him in the past at meetings that we've had here in Canada. So I'm really pleased to be able to turn the mic over to him for him to give his talk on visualization for the people, where we are now. Merci. All right. Thanks a lot for this very nice introduction. Hi, everyone. Uh, well, I should say hi from here because you won't see me much. I will be on the back right there. Uh, I'm sorry I cannot be here because I have a particular setup on my machine and I won't let the remote, I mean, if there is a problem, I need to run. So I will be staying there, but now you see me from the stage and I'll be moving out there to talk to you about this uh, problem, which is like, I'm interested in one of these issue uh, related to visualization and, and um, so I'm working in a, in a very nice uh, group with a lot of very nice people. Two are here, two and a half, I would say, uh, are here, uh, Petra, Tobias, and well, Lucas, who's now saying hi to everyone. Um, and so right now our research line are kind of split between two different worlds. So before we were doing visualization and visual analytics, and, um, and it was for professional people doing serious uh, stuff. So basically, when we were thinking about visualization or visual analytics, we had pretty much this kind of images in our mind, a lot of very serious people doing a lot of very serious uh, research. But since um, three or four years, we've started a new line of research, which I call visualization for the people. And it's meant to use visualization for people who are not in the same, um, in the same uh, frame. So these people, professionals, basically they are paid for doing a job and they have to use the best possible tools. And if the boss tells them to learn a particular tool, such as a visualization tool, let's say Tableau, they will do it. And they will take the time it takes to learn the tool and they will not have any say uh, because it's more effective. But the things are changing now and now visualization is aimed at very different people from those professionals. And those are people like these ones, uh, like your grandparents, for, for example, but also your neighbors or everyone. And these people have leisure time and they want to do things during their leisure time and visualization can help them. <clears throat> but there are a new audience they are exposed to visualization because visualization becomes much more active in, uh, in the internet or in the press. And also, they may want to, be, to learn about interesting facts for their the society in general, for making decisions about uh, political votes or whatever. So they can use visualization, but they are very different in kind from the profession that we were talking about. So here, um, we are doing research work for these people because we would like them to be able to make sense of the data out there and use visualization effectively, but they are very, very different. And so what we can see on the internet or on the newspaper is that people are trying to basically use very simple visualization to talk to the people in general because they say it's too complicated they won't understand, let's use very simple one and that would be enough. But as a research group, we don't have the same position. I think it's very important to be able to teach people how to read more sophisticated visualization because sometimes information out there is hard, is complicated, and you may need some more sophisticated visualization techniques to understand uh, those information. But as I said, when you are aiming visualization at the people in general, uh, you are in a very different uh, situation than from the professionals. Because people who are at home, like retired people or people during their leisure time, they, they, are not, they don't have a work or job to do. They are, they are ready to spend some time on their leisure time, but only if they are really interested, only it's about their hobbies. So they don't have any pressure. Um, they, they will not learn a new tool un unless they really understand that it's useful for them. But they need to understand it through some way. They, they will not be forced by anyone. And uh, 
whereas on the uh, industry side, people are under heavy pressure for time and, and, and uh, money. Um, when you're at home, you don't want to spend money on things that you don't know, or not a lot at least. But actually, you have time. But then the question is, how can we explain or convince these people that visualization can help them take insight on the data and, and learn new things to make better judgment, better decisions, or learn new things? And that's really the thing. And so in order to conduct those, this research, we, could, we couldn't just have standard computer science PhD students, because we needed some more skills in graphic design and communication design. So the work I'm going to talk about today has been conducted by two PhD students who have now, they are not doctors actually, Samuel who is actually in Calgary or might be traveling between Calgary and Paris, uh, he's always traveling, and uh, Jeremy who is now in New York City but was also in Paris, and they are both uh, designers by training but they have also been doing a lot of work in computer science, and their PhD is really about bringing visualization to the people in different ways. So I'll be talking about their work, I'll be advising them, co-advising them, and that's really um, them. And so basically the research question that we're trying to address for when we talk about visualization for the people is we need an engaging visualization in order to basically push people to use or learn visualization when they are, they are doing their casual uh, work or they are trying to get more information. And so what we want to do is whether a visualization is engaging or not, if it's not engaging, they will not spend time learning it anyway. And if it's not engaging, how can we improve it? And then whether it's understood or not, because being engaging is not enough, we want to be sure that these people understand the data that they are seeing. And if it's not understandable by them, then how can we improve things so that they can understand it? So those are really the two questions. How to make visualization more engaging, and then how to make sure that it's also understood and not only playful and fun. So Samuel started with some interesting visualization uh, aimed at uh, people, and you can see them on the top. So, uh, in 2011, he, uh, he was awarded by uh, Google uh, for his visualization on top for the French elections. And uh, this visualization is online. And the way it works is very easy. So there are two rounds for the French national uh, presidential election. The first round, there are many candidates, maybe 12 or so. And then on the second round, there is only two candidates. And so what he did is he has been taking data from Twitter and each time somebody on Twitter was citing one of the candidates for presidency, he would create a small ball and drop it in one of the bin, and each bin is one of the runner-up candidates for presidency. And so they would stack up. And so after a while, you would see actually a bar chart, and it's a bar chart made of small balls. Each ball is actually contains the face or the icon on Twitter of the people who send the tweet. And you will see those tweets stacking up. And then you have a, a good overview of uh, who is, about who Twitter is talking about. So that was the, the visualization. And um, this visualization was extremely well received because uh, actually it's really hypnotic. When you open the page and you look at it, you can look at it for hours. And that's people usually did. So when the average time for watching a page on the, uh, on the web is about uh, 20 seconds or so, this one had an average of about four minutes, very long average. So it was really engaging for people, they were watching it. And so Samuel did a lot of uh, improvement on that and uh, he created extensions of that and this extension went on on a TV show uh, where people could vote for some of the positions that were explained on stage. And the vote would actually be shown on stage by also the same tweets being actually uh, stacked up uh, like bar charts. And this uh, show was also very popular. So those two creations were actually variation on the same idea of uh, uh, simple visualization, but made very engaging 
through nice visual, nice animations and also showing interesting things because each of the dots contains the, the image icon of the people on Twitter that sends it. So when you're watching TV, you can see your own uh, small ball, you know, in, uh, going inside the, the right uh, level and you can, you can relate what's on TV to what you're doing. So that was really um, the, the start of his work. And he did a lot of variation on, on, that, uh, on those visualizations. Like you can see, they are really fun. And he basically realized that if you use a metaphor called the metaphor of sedimentation, you can create a whole series of visualization that look really nice and that would visualize some time evolving phenomena uh, using nice property and people will, would understand it right away. And why do they understand it? Because basically this process of sedimentation is a natural process and people would relate to it. So they would interpret the falling of tweets, for example, just as falling of snow. And then the sedimentation, just like as the sedimentation of snow. And so anyone can understand the visualization, the evolution, the time evolution of the visualization due to the fact that it sticks to, uh, uh, to a phenomenon that exists in nature. So it follows a nice metaphor. And the use of metaphor is very interesting for people to be able to understand right away how visualization works. So his work has been really about, um, about trying to bring uh, techniques and method and metaphor to create understandable, understandable and engaging visualization for the people. And then later on uh, with Sheila Carpendel here, he made a lot of studies about how to uh, create nice visualization and how can people understand those visualization. And really the point about uh, the study is the use of tokens. And I think this is really the takeaway message uh, from his thesis and from his work is that people can relate visualization when it's not too abstract. And so ARIA charts, bar charts, uh, pie charts are very abstract for most people because they don't understand what these areas are for. But if you populate those areas with small tokens and those tokens represent something, one person, one tweet, or one value, like one bill of something, then they understand what it means and then you can stack them up and they will still understand that those things are stacked and they add up. And so really that's one of the first um, uh, thing that uh, we came up with is you can create visualization for the people. You can use the standard visualization as we know them, but in order to make them more understandable, instead of using areas uh, which are abstract, fill them up with small tokens and people will understand tokens because they will understand what are the bits of information that creates the whole area charts. And that's really important. And then I can talk for, I, hours about his, his work because it's really, and it's actually continuing. But he also revealed that this using tokens would also help people understand visualization and make them active in creating visualization instead of using area chart. But that's another area uh, more about teaching visualization and that he's pursuing. But really the takeaway message is if you do visualization for the people, try to break it down into smaller units and tokens and this makes it easier for, to understand because it, people can relate to the areas. So that was one of the, the uh, work and you can read a lot about it with visual sedimentation and you can actually use his toolkit uh, in JavaScript to create your own visualization by, by just variation of uh, sediment, the sedimentation process. But then uh, along the same line, uh, what the work we did with Jeremy uh, Boy was about engagement and understanding how people can understand visualization and whether they do understand visualization. And I'll be talking about visualization, literacy, engagement, and I'll be just, well, saying a couple of things about interaction literacy, but that's really the problem. So here, the, the question is, um, is, a little bit, uh, is a little bit different. So uh, one of the question is, We've been doing a lot of experiment online to try to see whether people could understand the visualization and could make sense of them. But we had weird results from our, our uh, exploration or our first uh, evaluations. And, and so 
as visualization experts, we believe that everybody understands visualization. And, and as experts, we are not the only one to, to believe so. So there's been a, an interesting uh, quote on, on this person uh, who is a contributor to Forbes.com. And he says that the nice thing about chart is that we all get it. When we see a chart, we all get it. And that is, that is his own uh, position about charts. And I guess when we get used to using visualization, we believe that everybody sees a chart and they all understand the chart immediately and they get the information. But the question is, is that true? And the answer is uh, no, it's not true. We don't. They don't. So initially, we were trying to work on this problem of engagement for showing nice visualization online to engage people in, into exploring more visualization about open data. We made a lot of experiments and realized that actually people don't understand the visualization. They just don't get it. We show them nice charts. We craft them well. But most of the mechanical Turks or our friends or parents or grandparents, you show them, they will just have no clue what it shows. They don't understand it. So there seems to be a problem due to the fact that we, or our society does not expose people enough to visualization. And so people have no clue on how to parse and interpret those visualizations. And so since it has caused a lot of problem on our experiments on Mechanical Turk, one of the questions we asked ourselves is, can we assess the level of visualization literacy of, uh, of people? That was the first question. And, um, and actually, yes, the answer is yes, we can. So we, we did some interesting work with uh, Ron Singh here also, and, and uh, yes, he's here, and uh, Enrico Bertini from NYU on visualization literacy. So what, do we, what is visualization literacy? I'm not talking about what people call visual literacy. Visual literacy is much broader and is not as precise. So visualization literacy, we came up with a precise definition. And uh, if you want to challenge it or to discuss it, I'm, I'm open to it because I think it's an interesting topic. So for us, visualization literacy is uh, uh, is a, an interesting or is a problem about controlling. So what this one is about, uh, the, this, this sentence is about uh, measurement. So we want to measure because measuring is important. So this sentence, I took it from James Harrington, who was an expert on, on uh, standardization and, and measurement. And uh, I don't like it at all. I just think that every talk should have a, uh, a quote from somebody, but uh, I think this, not, this is not a good one. Uh, <laughs> So I'll let you read it and, and tell me what you don't like it. But I, I think measurement is, is important, but sometimes there are things that you cannot measure and they are also important. But anyway, uh, this is a quote I put in my talk in order to uh, inspire people and uh, maybe criticize it. So, um, so the work we did was really, uh, the initial motivation was really the following. You're doing an experiment with somebody and you're asking that certain question about the visualization. Do you see that there is more X and Y than the trend is going that way or that way? But first, you want to be sure that this person understands what is visualization at all. So you want to avoid the situation where the guy, the person in front of you, does not understand anything. So it's a test that we want to do to see whether the person has some ability to be able to read visualization at all. And it has to be, if possible, short reliable and easy to administer. If it takes hours, it won't really work. So here is the practical definition that we came out for visualization literacy. Um, so we, we define it as the ability to confidently use a given data visualization to translate questions that are specified in the, in the data domain into visual queries that are in the visual domain. And in the other direction, to interpret visual pattern in the visual domain as properties of the data in the data domain. So if I'm asking you a question about your income, this is, this is the data domain, okay? Is your income increasing? This is the data question. And then if it's a bar chart, it will translate in, is this bar chart growing from left to right? This is a visual domain. And so the question of visualization literacy is, can you do the translation from the question 
in the data domain from to the visual domain, and vice versa, being able to understand that the thing is growing, the, the bars are growing in size, meaning that the income is growing in, in, uh, in size too, or uh, in value. So that's our definition. And again, I've, there has been a lot of debate about this definition, but uh, I'm open to discuss it, and I think it still holds. Also, you can make it broader if you want, but this one is, in, is interesting, because I would say that people who cannot do the relation between the perception and the data, and cannot do it confidently, so maybe he can do it, but he doesn't trust what he sees, is not, not literate in visualization. So that's our definition. And so there are a lot of different uh, literacies, and you, you know them all. And actually, there are a lot of tests to test uh, literacies. And the most well-known is a textual literacy, and there are tests to see how literate are people. But there are other for mathematics, so numeracy, for example. And there are international tests, etc. But not on visualization so far. Uh, so. What we want to do is really a test similar to the literacy test or the numeracy test, but for, for visualization. Okay. Um, and so you may know some of those tests, and you may have taken them sometimes. But actually, there are two kinds of tests out there. Some are there to assess your level of literacy in one way or the other. So like the PISA OECD test is testing all the students, all the children of 14 around the world, and are trying to assess their level in different domains. That's one. But then there is another one, which is what, what is called a fallback test. When people fail the standard tests about literacy, then there are fallback tests which are said, OK, this guy has a problem. Where, where is this problem, and how bad is he? So this is like illiterate tests. If you're not literate enough, then you go to this fallback test. And actually, the test that we want to do is this fallback test to just be able to spot people who are just unable to read visualizations. Okay? So they exist uh, in for other kind of uh, literacy uh, as well. So how would you do it? Uh, if, you're, if you're a prof, well, the way you do it is very standard. You do tests, you administer them to the students, then you grade the students, and then you think that the grades are a good proxy for their literacy level. Okay, that's good. But actually, how do you do it? Well, uh, it's kind of magic. It's black magic. Nobody will tell you. Um, so the way you do usually is you, you do a series of questions. You believe that those questions usually grow uh, more complicated one after the other. And then you count the number of points. Uh, we give the number of points to questions. And so in this example, there are three people who are taking a test. And if the the, the tests are from the simplest to the hardest. They take 10 questions, for example, and they answer each question, and they are right or they are wrong. And then at the end, they have a score. And in that case, the score is just the sum of the good, uh, the question where they, they got a good answer. So what does this test reveal here? It reveals that Jenny is seven, so he, she's better than the two others, Chris and Rob. And Chris and Rob have two, and does Two means that they are all of the same ability or not. And I said at the beginning that actually the questions are sorted by simplicity. So actually, they have two. But if you look at the pattern of the question, Rob has two at the beginning, so they are the simplest question. Whereas Chris has two at the end, which are the hardest question, which is kind of weird. So those tests, the tests that we administer for students, uh, they are of this kind. And of course, the result we have is kind of not very precise, um, and, and we cannot really compare the students uh, unless we are really careful. And sometimes students can guess answers or not. So in order to do something more formally, uh, there is a, a statistical theory called item response theory, which actually maps a questionnaire to a level of difficulty of question in a statistical way. And by doing that, basically, it goes into two steps. First, it does a first step, which is meant to uh, find that scale. So we basically measure how easy or how hard is a question. And then when those questions are calibrated, then they can be administered to other people. And from this calibration, you can measure the ability of these other people. But those are statistical tests. So not only can they tell you whether people are good or not, but sometimes they fail the statistical test fails. So it says, according to these questions, I cannot 
the test cannot say whether this question is harder than that one. And that's the problem of finding the right question for the right uh, tests. And this is a calibration phase question. So the item response theory basically is meant uh, for finding questions that can be used in order to assess the uh, literacy or the level of people. So we use that. And how does that, how does that work, basically? Well, the, the test will check for every for a set of questions. And so for every question, what it does is you administer the test initially, and you administer that to 20 students, for example, and you look how many of the students answer well to each of the questions. And out of that, you know how hard the test is. Because if more people get the right answer, then it's easier than if less people get the right answer. And if it's completely unpredictable, it means that actually they are not comparable. And so you can have a, a curve for each question, uh, which ranks its difficulty with actually three variables. The three variables are the difficulty level, but also the discrimination level. So some questions are more discriminative than others. And then there is a third, the third one, which is the, the guess factor. How, how well can you guess the answer? Or how important is it guessing? So um, the, the model of the item response theory basically allows you with enough samples to be able to say for each question what is its difficulty, which is the, in this index B here, and also the level of um, uh, discrimination. So whether this particular question discriminates well between two levels or two different persons. So in that particular case, there was two people who were passing a test, and this one question could be very discriminate, discriminating and so you could say this one is better than the other one because of that particular question. So the, the method that we have been developing uh, is based on two phases. One phase is to administer the, a series of questions to a sample a set of people uh, as a design phase just to calibrate the test and then to improve the question and then you can go to an assessment phase where you can apply the test to as many people as you want. So in order to create good questions, well, you have to balance the level of difficulty of the question. So how do you balance the level of difficulty for a visualization? Well, there are several parameters. So you can ask a question about you know, five items on a data set, 10 items on a data set, 100 items, 10,000 items, etc. So one way is to increase the number of uh, items for increasing the complexity. You can have more data sets coming in, so you can have one curve, two curves, three curves. You can change the layout, and you can do also add distractors, things that are not useful, but that would basically distract the person to see whether somebody notices the distractor and interprets it well. And then you have a lot of tasks that are well documented in the literature. And then um, there are also the nature of the questions. And for the nature of the question, so the tasks are kind of standard, I guess. If you've read things about visualization and visual analytics, you know about the standard tasks that we do. What's a little bit novel is the level of question. So what we found out is that there are at least three levels of question that are more or less challenging for people. So one level of question, the simplest one, are the perceptual question. Is this bar bigger than that bar, or is this bar lighter than that bar? Those questions are purely perceptive questions. And everybody can answer those questions unless they have a problem with their vision. So there's been a lot of tests on perception in the internet, and we can administer those things. So if we ask questions like, is the bar 1 bigger than the bar 2, this is a, a perception level question. It's very easy. Everybody can do it. And then a next level is what we call high con highly congruent questions. And then the hardest level is the lowest low congruent question. And so uh, I'll be talking about congruency a little bit later, but this is an interesting one. So what do we call what do I call congruency? Well, congruency for visualization is a particular property which allows you to uh, translate a question in the visual domain in the data domain extremely easily. So let's take a bar chart. You have bars of different sizes, and I'm asking you. Is your, this, these bars are showing you my uh, salary over time. Is the salary increasing? When you have a highly uh, congruent visualization, like a bar chart, I can 
just remove the salary word and replace it with the bar word, so the, and that works exactly the same. So the question in the visual, visual uh, word can be translated or replaced by the question in the data word and vice versa. And so there are a lot of visualization, well, not, uh, there are four or five visualization techniques that are congruent in the sense that if you replace the data question by the visual, by the, yeah, visual question, it works the same. And, well, that's not surprising, but those are the popular visualizations. So I'll talk about it uh, later. Remember it, I put a, a small dinosaur so you remember it, because people remember better when they are, there is a dinosaur next to the question. Um, so I'll be talking more about those, um, those congruency questions. So anyway, as, you as I said, in order to vary the difficulty of question on visualization, we can vary all these parameters, the number of items, the number of time series, the distractors, all the tasks, and uh, use different kind of visualization, some being simpler, other being harder, uh, based on the congruency, for example. Then we create tests, and we administer the tests, and what we did is initially we created tests for all the possible visualization together and went through that process, but actually the statistical model didn't fit. It says, I cannot, I cannot find the right fit. So basically what we did is we separated all the visualization techniques, and when separating the visualization techniques, then the test would work. Okay? So it's important, it's not like a magic thing. You put everything together, you shake it, and it works in the end. You have to be careful. Uh, when you shake it, it cannot work, it cannot mix, actually. So this is an example of a, of a test question that, uh, that we did. It's a question for comparing the maximum value of a time series. We ask for what is the planet where the evolution has been growing uh, faster or higher, for example, and people have to answer, uh, and they can be wrong or they can be right. That's the way it works. So we, we created a lot of those questions, and then we we administer them to a, to a first uh, set of people, then we try to fit, that, to fit those answers to, uh, to the model, and, and then we take the simplest possible model, and then uh, we see how it works. So what can come out from those tests? So here are the results from two of our tests on, uh, on line charts, uh, line graph. So each of the, the lines that you can see are item response for each of the questions. And so uh, actually the first one use two parameters. The second one used only one parameter, the one parameter being basically the level of difficulty. Uh, it was enough to fit the model. The second one needed the two parameters. So what you see on the first one is lines. Each line corresponds to a question. And so each question has a level of difficulty. So whether it's on the left or on the right, the left ones are the easy one, the right one are the hard one. And also you can see that the curve can be more or less flat. When the curve is flat, it means that it has a very low discriminant power. So you're never sure if somebody has right that he's really in that level or basically maybe a bit less or maybe a bit better. Whereas the sharp one, the very sharp one, then they really make a strong distinction. People who can answer that question are really at that particular level of uh, skill. So once you have done this first stage, you have all those lines for all of the questions. What you can do is you can basically simplify the test. You remove the one that are not good statistically, so the, the one that are too, the slope is, is too uh, uh, flat, for example. And also you can remove the one that are, there are too many uh, questions that are around the same value of discrimination. So if they are redundant, you remove them so you want less of them. So basically you simplify the test and you come out with a, a certain number of questions that is kind of minimal in order to have the whole spectrum of all the tests. So that's what we did. We had a series of, uh, of questions for all of those visualizations. And then you can administer, administer them to as many people as you want. And in the end, when you apply that, uh, you have a score. And the score gives you an information about their visualization literacy. And the score is comparable for everyone. So uh, the score of zero means that they, they are average. And they are below zero, they are below average. And they are above zero, it's they are above average. And you can compare them. Uh, in the log it scale, which is a, a good scale. So basically with that work, and you can look up the, the article for more details, now we have an effective way of measuring visualization literacy. But this way works only 
for each visualization technique. So you can measure the visualization literacy for bar chart, for line chart, for uh, scatter plots, for tree maps, etc. You cannot put them all together and compare them, or at least we have not been able to do that. Because probably there are different literacy. People know how to read one technique or know how to read another techniques, but they don't have the same level of literacy over all the techniques. So we have a method for that. And actually, we have also a method to uh, deploy that online so that you can uh, get the result uh, online and you can go to this site and, and do it. We had some companies coming to us asking us to deploy that for their employees. And uh, so one possible thing is that they want to get rid of employees who are not very literate in understanding visualization. But uh, other interpretation, if they may want to move people who can read visualization quickly and well, to uh, statistics department or analytical department, and these people will be uh, right at the, at the right place. And of also maybe for recruiting people in those departments, they may want to see whether they are good at reading those visualizations. So uh, actually, you can do it for free. And now there is a platform that we've been developing with uh, Purdue University and the University of Maryland for deploying your own tests on uh, visualization literacy. So now. Uh, we have a way to be able to assess those low visualization literacy and either remedy, so find ways to teach them, or just discard them for our experiments. And, and that's, that, that's really useful for, for what we're doing and also to be able to, to measure ability of people, for example, for a class, uh, starting a class. Um, but so, We've not done that in order to basically test people only. We've done that in order as a first step to be able to go beyond uh, this first level and to, to do nice visualization that are easy to learn and easy to, uh, to and playful and engaging, uh, but being sure that they are, not, they are well understood. Um, and again, um, there is this problem that you see again and again and again in visualization and that we are struggling against is this idea that there are only four types of visualization that are easy to understand by everyone. And so my claim here, and I, I need more experiments to show that, but my claim is that the visualization that are supposed to be easy to understand are actually the congruent visualization. So the visualization techniques where you can replace the word in visual space from the word in data space and vice versa. So people can guess how to read them. And so now that visualization is becoming very popular, you can see a lot of people telling you that only those kind of visualization can be understood by people. And actually, it's not completely true. They can be interpreted, but they cannot be read very easily. And I think it's not it's not fair to say that we have to limit ourselves to these four kind of four kind of visualization, because there are other kinds that are not congruent but are very efficient, extremely efficient. And so we should, of course, aim at using the most efficient one, but also are finding ways to teach how to use them and to increase the visualization literacies for the ones that are more difficult or not congruent at all. The good news is that they don't take it doesn't take a lot of time to understand them. It takes minutes. It's not like reading a new language or reading a new, a new writing. It's, a, it's not in terms of days. It's really in terms of minutes. Uh, so really my takeaway message on that is that even if you're working on companies, four companies that are asking you to use the four type of visualization, actually you're dragging down the capability of the humans to understand visualization. So my takeaway message is really use those four types of visualization which are congruent because they are very easy to understand and people can immediately uh, make sense of what they show, but also add other visualization that are more effective, more efficient in addition to those and find ways for people to learn how to use those more efficient visualization. That's really the way to go instead of dragging people uh, down to using the very simple ones. And really it takes a very short time for them to learn. Um, so basically that's 
what we've done in the recent visualization for the people, we've mixed several visualizations, some being simple and some being more uh, complicated, so that people are exposed to the more complicated one and can learn. And it takes minutes again, but it's very short. And so right now what we are working on is, uh, now that we can measure the visualization literacy, we are also interested in interaction, and interaction is even harder than visualization literacy, because when you have a chart on the internet that shows a visualization, then people can try to make sense of it. But if you can interact with it, then people have to guess to know that they can interact with it and to understand how to interact with it. And this is sometimes extremely complicated for them because they are just not exposed to interaction in general. So your grandmother or your grandfather has not been exposed to interacting with visualization. It's hard for them to read the visualization, but interacting with them is even harder. And so we are working in trying to make uh, things a little bit easier and understanding how people understand visualization. But really, we are, we are really starting. Again, um, we have been working on engagement and trying to find ways for people to understand visualization. And it's been speculated in the visualization community that storytelling was a good way for people to learn how to use visualization for exploration. And so storytelling is, is a great way to communicate information and, through visualization. There is no doubt about it. It's a new media, and I think it's really interesting to use that as a new media. But uh, we've been trying again and again to see whether we can use storytelling as a way to push people to interact with visualization, to explore data set, and we've been publishing a paper showing that actually it does not work easily. I mean, we have not found a way to use storytelling to engage people into doing interaction. It seems to be completely separated. Storytelling is like reading. It's a, something a bit passive. You're watching at it, it unfolds. You're getting the message that somebody has, con uh, has brought to you through this medium but it doesn't entice you to take the control of it and continue to interact. It doesn't at all, actually. So what we found is that um, pushing people to interact is very hard because people are not used to it. And we try several ways. And storytelling does not seem to be the one that will work to bring them to interact. So now we are working more in the direction of gamification. Can we do gamified visualization where people will be playing with the visualization to learn how to interact with the visualization? But there is a catch with gamification is that you can very easily go in the wrong direction by having very playful, uh, very fun uh, game-like things, but they are not related to understanding data, actually. So you have to be careful to keep uh, the visualization and the, the goal, uh, which is understanding data and not playing with the interaction at all. So that's, the, that's really the, the tension. And with that, uh, I'm done. And so I'm open for questions and discussions. Uh, uh, thanks a lot for your attention. I hope you had a good meal. Say it again, sorry. Is there a congruent visualization related to time or change, time series event? Is that one of the, could that be the pivot? Well, time and change is, is tough, actually. Um, so, so, yeah, Samuel has been working on time visualization and his use, but uh, the, the use of animation for time is usually very bad. Uh, there's been a lot of articles on that. Because your short term, your, your memory will not remember what has happened in the. So um, currently, the, the, the way to visualize time is really to use one of the dimensions of the space. And the standard way people use is to use a time series where, they, where the time goes from left to right. Uh, and that's what the New York Times is doing, and that's what a lot of people are doing. Uh, and there's been a variation, and there's been a lot of controversies about those variations. Some have used you know, spirals to show time. Uh, but with Alberto Cairo, we've been arguing against spirals, because spirals are very hard for people to 
perceive depending on the angle, but they look really nice. So there's been a tension between the you know, artis artistic appeal of the spirals and its efficiency. Um, but really, for the time, the, the right metaphor, the right thing is that it, it you know, goes linearly and goes from left to right. So that's, that's the, standard, uh, the standard one so far. Can you stand yeah, I can, sure. Ah, that might be easier. Like yes. I know you. Yes, so yeah. And so on. Yep. So when you're talking about a visual literacy test, how can you make sure that what you're testing is actually the literacy of somebody being able to read bar charts in general, no matter how they design, versus their ability to read this particular chart that you're showing? Well, okay, so yeah, there's been an interesting workshop on visualization literacy at the last VIS conference, and so yes, actually. In visualization literacy, like in any other literacy, there are let, a lot of different levels. And when, you were, when we're talking about uh, uh, literacy, textual literacy, the tests are really about can you read at all, from can you understand simple sentences, to can you understand more sophisticated things like irony, for example, irony is hard, to even more sophisticated things uh, uh, where context is involved uh, or knowledge is involved, etc. So, and Alberto Cairo in his keynote has been actually addressing that also because a visualization can be true according to the data, but misleading in terms of interpretation. He was showing the map of Ukraine and the vote for people who wanted to uh, go cl closer to the uh, Russia and people wanting to go closer to Western Europe. And it was a clear split from left to right. And so people could take from that visualization that the Eastern part of Ukraine wanted to get unified with Russia. But actually, the polls about unifying Ukraine with Russia was from 80% against in the East side to, uh, I think, 60% against on the, on the East side. So basically, yes, there was, there was some People on the east side were more for Russia than the other ones, but none of them wanted to get be unified with Russia anyway. So in order to be able to understand these things, you need to be aware of the whole context and to understand what is a poll and what is a poll about and what it means. So it's the same for a scatter plot or a bar chart. If you, if you see a bar chart, you can be fooled by what it shows because you don't have enough context or you make false assessments. And you have, also, of course, all the bad ways of doing bar charts. So what we've been doing is using very simple bar chart with very simple question to avoid those higher levels of interpretation. Uh, can you avoid them altogether? Maybe, maybe not. But the fact that it's based on the statistical model and you can repeat it means that it's probably stable, I mean, uh, repeat, repeatable at least. So I think we are, for this level of assessment immune to this problem. But if you want to go to the higher level tests for visualization, then it will be much harder because you don't know what is the background of the people reading the visualization. You don't know, uh, I mean, there are a lot of things that, that get into the way, so it's harder, yeah. Yes, sorry. So uh, thank you for the, the presentation. I really enjoyed the actually very important to understand and to promote visualization literacy and I think that it's important to visual literacy. My question actually refers to some parts of your presentation in which you make a distinction between designers and computer scientists. And so in your, one of your slides you say that designers, um, good designers make engaging uh, visualization and good researchers slash engineers Make effective uh, visualization. And then, in one of your conclusion, uh, concluding slides, you say designers are doing their best. They should go beyond individual excellence and provide validated, validated guidelines. And your next uh, dot, uh, point there was computer scientists should focus on engagement and vulnerability, not on streamlining again the use of voice and the visualization. So, my question is. One, is, uh, are you, do you think that designers 
designers and uh, researchers, research and computer scientists as you wrote, uh, are, is, is this a typography? Or is this uh, just a secondary? No, okay. <laughs> no, so, say it again. I haven't heard the, the question. The uh, so are they what? Are, are you considering these a typography? So they oh. are proposing, yeah. you know, they're one or another, right? Or is this a spectrum, or is this whatever else I would assume? Right? And the second part of the question is um, at least in my experience, I see a lot of people doing a lot of visualization. So the people in biology that traditionally have been doing this visualization, a different scheme, right? Yesterday, there are people in social science who have been doing the research for their own time, statistics. So it's it's not just uh, this what I sense is like a dichotomy. Uh, so I would like to expand on that. Uh, and uh, yeah, in that Okay. <laughs> yeah. No. So yes, I uh, no, I don't mean that they cannot. Uh, so. Right now, there is kind of a dichotomy between designers and computer scientists in the sense that they are trained in a very different way. So designers are trained in a visual way. So usually when they, you ask them for a visual solution or for a solution to a problem like creating, a, designing a nice visualization, they will do it. It will be engaging and nice. But if you ask them to explain why they did it, they are challenged sometimes because they are working very much by training. And so they use their, their experience but um, they, are not, they, are, they are not grounding their work on some theoretical background, etc. They are just experienced. And it works fine, I think. And I'm, I don't have any uh, problem with that. I think they are really useful because computer scientists don't do that at all and they are not good at that. But what I mean is that when you're talking about visualizations, you can make mistakes due to things related to perception or related to some... Um, interaction, etc., and usually they are not trained for that, so they can do very good design, but they can do mistakes due to their training, which are not as formal as in psychology, perception, and computer science sometimes. But on the other side, that's a traditional training, and maybe some people around here are creating training programs for designer school who, that are incorporating more theoretical background on perception, on interaction, on computer science that are filling this gap. So I think this is, and this is really important, and I see that coming in France, and I'm sure it's coming here in Toronto or at Simon Fraser, etc. So I think this is not inherent, but this was a tradition in the past. And computer scientists, clearly, most of them, they will do kind of efficient kind of visualization sometimes, not always, but sometimes, but clearly guaranteed to be ugly. I mean, 99% uh, of the things that they are doing is pure ugly, and, and people don't like it, but they are operational. So, and, and also, when computer scientists don't have a good answer about how, what feature to use in terms of uh, visual feature or interaction feature, they are stuck. They take something at random. They have no no idea on how to resolve the problem, whereas the designers, they always have good intuition, or I call that intuition, call it whatever you want. They, they have good solutions to solve problems that they, they don't know formally, but they, they have good intuitions. That's their training. So that's kind of the dichotomy, but I don't mean that it cannot change. I just mean that right now, due to the curriculum of design schools and of computer science departments, that's very much how I, how I see it. But I, I guess the challenge of uh, the new generation is to be able to fill that gap because, I mean, as a researcher in computer science, I need the skills of designers and I will never acquire it. And I think also that designers need some skills in computer science. I mean, probably uh, some training that has been doing coming here. But yeah, yeah, so and then for the second question about so yes, there are a lot, there are a lot of domains who have particular visual representation and they're very familiar with it and this is fine. But then they tend so sometimes it's good, but sometimes they tend to stick to them when they are not very very efficient and because there is a tradition. And here we can see that there is a kind of a tension between the visual representations that are good for publications and that are conveying a good message for publication and the one that are efficient for exploration. 
and they are very different. And I'm struggling really with that with uh, domain scientists because the domain scientists would tell you this representation is a tradition, we use it, etc. And you say, fine, you use it in your publication, this is fine to convey your result, but for exploration, use another one because this one is not efficient. And they would struggle. So there are, there are issues, but I agree with you that there is a long tradition uh, in different domains of different visual representation. But so very often they are not for exploration, but for communication. And this causes some tension too. Okay? Hope I answered it. Yeah. Sheila. Yeah. Um, so I think I have a very good case. Um, visual representation. Um, so I want to not very visualization. Not even. Do you have any suggestions about um, changing this? About, sorry? About changing this? About oh, how yes. So, yeah, but I'm sure. I mean, the easy answer is wait 10 years and it will resolve. That's, that's the easy one. Uh, so, in 10 years, we will not be there anymore, or maybe, maybe not, not, not me. Um, but uh, yes, that's the easy answer. If you wait, if it's good enough, it will just go through everyone. Um, so, the other one is, of course, you can expose people more often to the visualization. But my, my feeling is that we need to train the new designers anyway to use efficient and good visualizations uh, so that to convey the thing and then people will be talking about it so I think we just need to to be, make sure that more good visualizations are created and I would hope that uh, people will be talking about it uh, that's for the older ones so are you actually suggesting uh, like the developer saying that blurred lines are how oh yeah of course Oh, sure. Yeah, uh, but for the new generation, I think we need to push very hard on having some curriculum of design uh, on in our computer science uh, uh, curricula and vice versa. But so curricula is something, but it doesn't solve completely the problem because even if you tell the computer scientists that you know being good at graphic design is important, they will not learn how to draw well because that's not their training and they don't care. So I think it's more a problem of having them work together. And so we need to have them working together more often. That's really the, the, the way to address it. And in order to do that, they just need to get to common ground. So I think this, this summer school is perfect for that because you have several different kinds of people who are together. And it takes a little bit of time to understand the vocabulary that they each other use because they are slightly different. But once they know it, then they can work together in companies. And that's the way to do it, to accelerate the thing. And, I have other, I mean, like you, we have some clues on how to do that at the lower level, so like kindergarten, etc. But that's for the next generation. So uh, by that time, people will be more familiar with visualization. I just want to make a quick comment yeah. on this. Um, I was probably 90% of the media, 10 teams, and both venues, team, and it's led by your work. We have designers and computer scientists working together. One of the things that came out of our work these past years, you it wasn't enough have a designer on a team of pure scientists because they were trained in each other's specialties. And so we actually have been awarded an insert create grant for 1.6 million to create a curriculum where we would be able to design courses where both the designer and the computer yep. scientists would both be able to take the same courses and it would be an internship where they would be able to be placed in the industry. So that's part of the solution. Yeah, that's that's a very good solution. Yeah. Hi, I think you may have answered my question the previous one, but my question has more to do with the general public rather than designers and computer science people, which generally we are here. But I'm, I'm in the software startup, and we're developing a platform that can make it accessible to the general public and whoever participates. Uh, we give them access both to their own data they're producing all the time, and data about the communities and the environments around them. And everybody in general is very curious about themselves. So my question is, yeah, I mean, you said wait 10 years and things will improve, but do you think that that's the case as well for the general public? Are they somehow being, because of the proliferation of all this visualization, are they somehow being educated as well passively on how to read these things? Like, given, given access to these data, would would the general, would it, uh, just a, a normal person want to play with that different data and see visualizations themselves? 
I mean, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not aware of any studies on how visualization permeates the whole uh, public, but my f gut feeling is that there are people who are interested because they are doing a lot of sports, so they will be interested in this quantify self thing, and they'll be interested in understanding their own uh, the data about their own body. They will get used to it because it's important for them. So those are the hobbyists that I was talking about. So people with a particular purpose, if they realize that visualization will help them, they will learn it, and that will be natural. My feeling is that if you go in the in the middle of Canada or in the middle of France, in a place where people are not particularly interested in their, you know, physical cap capabilities or whatever, um, then I'm not sure that visualization will permeate that easily because there will be no particular, you know, engaging question that they will want to answer through visualization. So that's where the divide will still reside. So this this particular population. I don't know yet how to, to teach them, except doing nice visual for, on newspapers or on, on websites where they can get engaged and play with it. So that, that's really the target that is difficult to address. But people with particular hobbies and they want to do that well, then if they realize visualization will help them, they will, they will do it. That's, that's not a question. They will do it easily. But I think there is a huge amount of people who are not in that case. And it will take them time. And so this is harder, I would say. I don't know if I'm answering your question completely, but that's my feeling. Okay. So I love the fact that you're coming from the perspective of the person who is not 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 the person Especially learning of those, we often see discussions of engagement as different situations. In other words, sometimes things are a little bit harder to do, but the more engaging you can tell yep. the time when you do them, the time you get that right back to the next stage of the time you can set yeah, that's right. But yeah, there is this funny situation when you are when you're doing things for visualization online, or so on the web, is that you are competing with the your your the attention is is competing between you know doing this visualization stuff that people are not aware of or not familiar with, and doing a zillion of other things that they are familiar with and they are attracting them so they can do uh, they can look at the statistics on football or they can look at some funny things on YouTube etc. So there is this strong competition which is slightly different when than when you were in a setting where you could play with something and you can spend the time. So. I think this is a slightly new, this problem of competition, of possible activity for leisure time. And you're competing. So if what you're doing is not engaging enough at, at first, at some point it can be a bit difficult. So just to give you, you know, keep put you in the flow, etc. But if it's not engaging enough at the first, at first, then people will just drift away and go to some, something else. So there is this new tension that people can just go to something else very quickly. Okay. Okay, thank you so much, Daniel, for your great talk. Thanks a lot. Thank